Welcome everyone to today's webinar on maximizing your use of the NEHGS online library catalog. My name is Ginevra Morse, the online education coordinator at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. As always, I'll be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer this webinar today for our members and friends around the world. Giving today's presentation will be Anne Marangolo, Technical Services Manager, and Emily Baldoni, Technical Services and Metadata Librarian. Anne and Emily are responsible for making sure the online library catalog meets your needs, whether it's linking resources by genealogical topic, uh, fine-tuning search results, or acquiring new materials. Anne will begin by giving an overview of the resources we have at NEHGS and how to access the online catalog. Emily will go over best practices for searching and Anne will then demonstrate some of the catalog's other features such as how to access our growing digital library, create and share source lists with family and fellow researchers, and more. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to type a question in the panel to the right of your screen. Anne and Emily will answer as many as they can in the time provided. If you don't see that question box, uh, you can expand the user panel by clicking on the icon of a white arrow with an orange background. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted to our website. All right, so without further ado, let's get started. Take it away, Anne. Thanks, Ginevra. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We're going to start off with a quick poll, just to get an idea of who, if anyone, has used a library catalog before. On your screen, a window will appear, and you can just click yes, you've used the catalog, or no, you haven't. I'll give you a moment to answer the poll, and then we can share the results. Uh, whether you have used the catalog or not won't matter for the webinar today, because I'm sure that there will be some things that both beginner and experienced users alike will find new and useful. So in a minute, we'll see the results. OK, great. So more than half of you have used the catalog before. Um, so you might learn some new things. And if you haven't touched it, this will be a great introduction for you. Okay, the New England Historic Genealogical Society Library at our headquarters in Boston offers a wealth of resources for genealogical and historical research. The library contains millions of unpublished items and published items, and the library catalog is the gateway to those resources. Let's start with a look at the scope and diversity of materials available to you in the library. There's about 30,000 published genealogies, 40,000 local histories, and state, city, and town records, over 5,000 journals, periodicals, including many family association and historical society newsletters, 12,000 rare books, and millions of manuscript items such as original family papers, diaries, account books, family Bibles, church records, cemetery transcriptions, photographs, and other items dating back over 400 years. We also have millions of records on microform, reference works, and more. All of these resources you can find through the library catalog. Our collection covers the entire world, but with a special emphasis on the United States, especially New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and Midwest. There's also Canada's eastern provinces, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island, and all of Europe. The best way to start exploring the library resources and to begin your research is through the library catalog. There are records for all of the items in the library and also links to online resources. The catalog is available for use by both members and non-members. With the catalog, you can search for resources by a keyword, surname, subject, etc. And Emily will go into more detail about constructing searches. You can link to digital editions, a growing number, a growing number of ebooks have links in our catalog, and there are also a number of books that can be borrowed online. We'll show some examples of this later on. You can access digital versions of unique NEHGS items. 
A feature for NEHGIS members, the library catalog is also a portal to digital versions of books and manuscripts items from the NEHGIS collection, which can be accessed from home. You can organize your research by saving and sharing records with family or fellow researchers. The library catalog allows you to save, print, or email a list of saved records, which you can use to plan your and organize your future research and bring with you if you visit the library in person. And finally, you can save preferred searches and rate resources, two useful member tools the catalog offers. We'll demonstrate all of these features throughout today's talk. First, let's look at how to access the catalog. You can start at the Society's main webpage, AmericanAncestors.org, and click Library from the top menu. Okay, there we go. This will bring you to a page with information about the library and library services, library databases, consultations, and links to our many subject guides. On the side navigation bar, you'll see you can do a quick search in the catalog by selecting either keyword, title, author, or subject from a drop-down menu. Type the search word in the box below and click search. If you want to start from the front page of the catalog and narrow your search even more, click Library Catalog under the top sidebar menu. The other option is to go directly to the catalog by using the URL library.nehgs.org. You don't need to be a member, but if you are an NEHGS member, you'll want to log in before doing searches so you can take advantage of all the features. To log in, click on the red Catalog Login button in the upper right corner. And you'll be taken to this next screen where you'll enter your last name and any HGS member number. And click Login. Okay, Emily is now going to talk about ways to search the catalog, viewing records, and accessing digital resources. Welcome, Emily. Great. Thanks, Anne. So in this next section, we're going to talk about how you can use the NEHGS catalog to search for books, periodicals, manuscripts, and any other type of resource that we have in the library. We'll go over the different types of searches that you can perform in the NEHGS catalog, and we'll also talk about a few tips and tricks that you, that you can use to make your searches more effective. But before we get into some specific search types and strategies, I want to take a second to point out a few places that you can go for quick help when you're searching in the catalog. So if you're on the main search screen, the one that we were looking at just a minute ago with Anne, then you'll see search tips and sometimes also some example searches just underneath the main search box, as you can see here. And you'll see that there's a customized example for each search type. So here um, on the screen, we're on the tab for the author search, and we can see a set of search tips and examples for author searches in that area underneath the search box. Now, as I said, these are customized by search type, so if, say, I were to go to the title search tab, then we'd see search tips for title searches and so on. So that's one re reference source that's um, really readily available when you're searching in the catalog. Another way to get uh, catalog help and general search tips is to use the Help button, which is located at the top right-hand corner of the screen. So when you click on that Help button, this will take you to a general help menu where you'll find more information about searching and navigating in the catalog. And by the way, there's also a documentation here on some of the other topics um, like saving searches and lists of records, which we'll be talking about more in a few minutes. So we won't go into all of this documentation in detail right now, but I just want to mention this right at the start because it's a good resource to be aware of as you're using the catalog. If you ever have a question about how to do something or how a particular search works, then this help documentation can be a good place to start. So now let's get into some specific search types and strategies that you can use in the NEHGS catalog. 
So as you're using the catalog, it's important to be aware of some of the different types of searches that are available. Because each of these searches, um, each of these search types works a little bit differently, and some of them are going to be better suited to certain tasks than others. So there are six main types of searches that you can perform in the NEHGS catalog. You can do a keyword search, which searches for a word anywhere in the record. You can search by the title of a specific book, um, if you know it. You can search for items by a particular author. You can search for resources that are about um, a specific subject. Uh, you can browse or search by call number. And then finally, there's also an advanced search, which um, basically allows you to combine several different types of searches and search criteria in a single search. So today, we'll be concentrating on um, the keyword, subject, and advanced searches. We'll be spending some extra time on these search types in particular because they're some of the most widely used searches in our catalog. And knowing how and when to use them will help you perform more powerful searches so that you can really get the most out of the catalog. So the first type of search that we're going to go over is a subject search. This allows you to search for resources that are about a specific topic, which is represented in the catalog through subject headings. Um, and there are some situations in which um, a subject search works especially well. Um, say, if you're looking for information on a particular family um, or a particular place, especially, say, a county, um, then searching by subject is really one of the best ways to perform searches that are both powerful and at the same time precise. And I'll explain more about why that's the case as we go on. So let's start by doing a search for resources that are about a specific county. So to perform a subject search from this main search screen, um, you would first go ahead and click on the subject tab, which you'll see we already have selected here. And then you would enter your search terms in um, the search box. Now, in this example, we're going to be searching for resources that are about Fulton County. Once you've entered your search terms, then you just click on search to execute that search. So after we um, hit search, then we get this list of subjects that includes the words Fulton County. So as you can see, there happen to be um, quite a number of different Fulton counties in the US. So just looking at this list right now, I can see that there is a Fulton County in Arkansas. Um, there's a Fulton County, Ohio. There's another one in Illinois, another one in Georgia. So, in this particular case, let's say that I'm looking for local histories that are about the Fulton County that's in Georgia. Um, so in order to do that, from here, I can just click on the link that says Fulton County, Georgia History. And I'll be taken to a list of all of the resources that the library has on that topic. OK, so here we've clicked through to an individual record in this Fulton County, Georgia search. So at the top of the record, um, you can see some sort of basic, um, basic identifying information about the book, uh, things like the author, the title, uh, where the book was published and when. Um, towards the middle of the record is where you find um, sort of information that would allow you to actually locate the book um, within the library. So we can see that this book is on the, four the fifth floor. Um, we can see the call number that describes its exact location um, on the shelves. Um, we can see that the book is available uh, for use, and so on. And then at the bottom of the record, um, we get some additional information about the book. So in particular, we can see that this is a reprint. Um, it's got 912 pages. Um, it has an index, and so on. And then finally, we can also see um, the subject headings that have been assigned to this book. So in particular, we see that they include um, Fulton County, Georgia history which, of course, is what allowed us to retrieve the record um, with our subject search in the first place. Now, before we move on, um, I want to point out just a couple of things about the subject search that we just did and what makes it a little bit different from basic keyword searching that you might be more familiar with. Now, because I did a subject search, I know that all of the resources that I retrieve really will be about that topic. In contrast with, say, a keyword search, I might sometimes get a larger number of results with that keyword search, but the results are probably going to be less precise since the words can come from any part of the record. Um, they could from, come from the title, the author, publication information, and so on. 
So, for example, if I were to do a keyword search uh, for those same words for Fulton County, then I'll probably still get resources that are about Fulton County, Georgia, but I'll also get lots of other stuff, lots of possibly unrelated stuff that I'm going to have to wade through in order to find out what I'm really interested in. So in addition to those resources that are about all of the different Fulton counties in other states that we saw, um, I might also get books that are about, say, the Fulton family, um, books that are written by someone named Fulton, um, or even something that just happens to be published in a town called Fulton. So you can start to see why a subject search can sometimes be a more precise way to search in the catalog. So we've just looked at how to use the subject search in order to search for resources that are about a specific county. Now we're going to look at the other type of search that works extremely well as a subject search, um, and that's searching for, for materials that are about a specific family. So to perform this search, um, we'll again select that subject tab here um, from our main search screen, and then we'll type in our search string. In this case, um, uh, I'm going to type in Athy family, um, and we do uh, recommend um, typing in searches for family, family names in the form that's shown here, basically the surname followed by the word family, um, because that's the way that family names are represented as subject headings in the catalog. So once that's there, then I will click search. So this is what happens when I execute that search, and something kind of interesting is happening here. Um, this won't necessarily happen for every subject search, um, but in this particular case, at first we get this note instead of a list of resources. Now, it's not that we don't have books about the Athi family. We do, but what the catalog is trying to tell us here is that there's a better way to search for this particular family's name. So we get this note here um, that says, um, Athy family, spelled A-T-H-Y, is not used in this library's catalog. Athy family, spelled A-T-H-E-Y, is used instead. And then we get a link that we can click on to see all of the resources that are about the family. And what we're seeing here is one of those special functions that the catalog has to try to bring together all the resources that are about a particular family, even if the family's surname might have several different forms or spelling. And as I'm sure you know, a surname can have lots of different forms. So this is something, again, that would not happen if I was just doing a plain old vanilla keyword search. Um, this is only something that would happen if I was searching in the subject index. So again, this is another reason why subject searching can sometimes be really useful, especially for family names. So when I click on that Athy family link, um, I'm taken to um, the brief record display, which we're viewing here. Um, and it shows us uh, a list of the resources that meet the search criteria, along with some brief information about each of them. So we can see from um, the location um, and also the uh, little icon on the left here um, that this, uh, our first hit here is, happens to be a manuscript, so it's held in our special collections department. Um, if we keep looking down here, we see that uh, records two and three are both books, and you can see some brief information about them from this screen as well. Now, one thing that I want to point out while we're here, um, note uh, here that there is a save record button that appears at the right of each record that we've retrieved. Um, and this you can use to um, basically save an item that's of interest to you. We'll talk more about how this works later, but I just want you to notice for now that it appears um, with your initial results list. So let's click on record number two um, for Captain George Athey to see some more information about this book. So now we're looking at the full record display, which shows us all the information that the catalog has about this book. Now this particular book is a genealogy of the Athey family, and it's a good example of um, the type of additional information that we add to our catalog records at NEHGS, especially in the case of genealogies, um, to try to make that record a little bit more useful and easier to find for our users. So this record has a subject heading for um, the Athey family right at the top of the subject section. Um, this is the main focus of the book, but um, you'll notice that there's also a whole set of um, headings for a number of uh, other families in the area below that. 
other families that, though maybe not the main focus of the book, also receive a lot of coverage within it. And then at the very bottom here, you can see that there are headings for several counties that have a lot of information in the book. So these are all things that we add to make the catalog more useful for users who are specifically doing genealogical research. Um, and I would note um, that a lot of other libraries that more general libraries that don't have such a strong focus on family history, um, they might just have a single family heading um, for the main family and maybe just a general geographic heading for uh, Maryland genealogy or even, in some cases, U.S. genealogy, which is not the most helpful. Um, so we also try to add um, some other helpful information to the record, uh, like, for example, the uh, table of contents um, note that you see here, um, which helps to give you an idea, a better idea of what's covered in the book. Now, you might have noticed that all of these subject headings that we were just looking at um, are links. A great thing about this, and something that people don't always immediately realize, is that because these are linked, um, that means that you can use these subject links to expand your research and to browse to additional resources that you're interested in. So, for example, let's say that I am also, in addition to the Athy family, maybe I'm also interested um, in uh, Galway, Ireland. So when I see that heading for Galway in the subject list, um, I can click on it. And I'll be taken to a results screen that shows me um, the heading for Galway, Ireland genealogy right here. Um, and it's displayed in an alphabetical list with some related subjects. So if I click on that link, then I'll be taken to see everything that the library has on that subject. So basically, um, as you can kind of see um, from the search box up at the top here, um, the catalog has done another subject search for me without me necessarily having to, you know, actually manually key in the search string um, or even figure out what exactly the subject heading is, what form it takes. Now, another good way of using a catalog record to browse to similar resources is by using the call number. So here on this screen, we're looking at another catalog record. Um, this one is for a book of marriage records from Houston County, Georgia. So you can see the call number right here in the middle of the record. So this call number has a couple of different functions. For one thing, uh, if you were to visit the library, then of course you would use this call number to figure out exactly where on the shelf the book would be. But in addition to this kind of basic location function, the call number also functions to bring similar resources together. And that's because the call number is assigned based on the subject of the book. So if I go ahead, um, I will click on um, that linked call number. And on this next screen, um, I've been taken to a new browse screen, um, which shows me the item that I was just looking at. You can see it down near the bottom here. Um, but I'm viewing it in the context of other library items that have similar call numbers. So as you can see here, I can now look at other books that are on the same topic, Houston County, um, such as, for example, um, let's see, I've got an 1850 federal census for Houston County. Um, I've got um, a book of wills and court, uh, court minutes for Houston County. I'll also be able to see on the same screen um, some records for some other Georgia counties nearby. Um, for example, near the top of the screen, we've got some stuff on Hart County, Georgia. Um, so I can get to that easily from here if I'm interested in that. So in a sense, what's happening here is this call number browse is kind of allowing me to replicate that um, sort of serendipitous experience of browsing in the stacks and finding related items in that way, even if I'm just um, on ho at home in my computer, on my computer. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's return to our um, brief record display for Galway, Ireland, and I'll show you a few ways of customizing how your results are displayed. Um, now, by default, results for most searches that you do in our catalog are going to be um, system sorted, um, as you can see that up on the top right here. Um, so system sorted, that's a little bit ambiguous. What does that mean exactly? Um, so when results are system sorted, um, what this means is that the results are basically displayed in the order that they were received by the library, um, with the most recently acquired resources displayed 
displayed at the top. Now sometimes that'll correspond roughly to the publication date, um, but as you can probably already see from this example, that's not always completely the case. Now for short result sets, the display order might not be very important. Um, for, for you know a set of four results, it doesn't maybe matter that much what order they appear in. But of course you can imagine when I have a longer list of results, I might want to change the order that things are displayed in, in order to make that list a little bit easier to navigate. So to do that, I'll click on that drop down me menu that is next to System Sorted right here. And when I click on that, a drop down appears and you can see the different options that I have for changing the sort order. So in this case, I'm going to select um, reverse year and then I'll click sort. And now my results appear sorted by year with the most recently published items appearing at the top. Now another thing that I can do from this brief record display is I can change my search type. Now of course I could also click on start over um, to just return to the main search screen, but I do also have the option of starting a new search from the brief record display itself. So to do this I will click on the um, search type drop down um, at the top here, which is currently displaying a subject since that's the most recent search that we did. So after I click on that, a drop down menu appears with all the different search options, which should be pretty familiar from that main catalog search screen that we saw. So in this case, I'm going to select a keyword search. And then once I've changed it to keyword search, um, then I can type in my new search terms here. And in this case, um, I'll search for Cops Hill. I can now click on um, the search button, and I'll run that new search. Okay, so here are my keyword search results. So a few basic things to notice about keyword searching. Um, the subject searches that we've been doing up to now have only been looking for matches in the subject heading fields of the record. Now, in contrast, a keyword search basically searches all the, uh, all the fields of the record. So that includes the title, the author, subjects, notes, and so on. Now, as I said before, particularly if you're searching for resources that are about a specific family or a specific county, then the subject search might be kind of the more powerful way to go. Um, but in some cases, um, in many cases, a keyword search might be the way to go to start out with at least, um, especially if you're not finding many results and you want to broaden your search, or if you're not sure exactly how a particular concept or place is going to appear in the subject headings. So in these cases, keyword searching can be a really great strategy for broadening your results. So let's take a look at how this works by looking at one of the records um, that was retrieved by this keyword search. Um, I'll click on record three here, which is historic bearing grounds report and inventory. And then when I bring up that full record display, uh, you can see how keyword searching retrieves matches from different parts of the record here. So when you do a keyword search, you'll see the parts of the record that, are ma that matched your search uh, will be highlighted in red in the catalog record. And as you can see, um, let's see, we've got a uh, match for Cop Sale in the subject headings, but in this case we've also got a match in the table of contents. In this case, um, this particular record would have also been retrieved by a subject search um, because it does appear, Cops Hill does appear in the subject headings. But you can imagine a lot of other situations where, say, um, a word might appear in a table of contents note, uh, but it might not have been a big enough part of the book to necessarily be included in the subject headings. So in that scenario, the record will be retrieved by a keyword search, but not necessarily by a subject search. Or you could imagine, say, if your search terms match the wording in the table of contents or the title, they use the same phrase to refer to it, um, but maybe the subject headings use a slightly different set of terminology. They use different words to describe the same thing. Um, and in that case, too, you might get a match on a keyword search, but not a subject search. So again, think of keyword searching as a way to broaden your search results. Now, as we discussed before, um, from here, you could also go on and click on the linked subject headings um, to get a full list of items that are about the topic. 
Um, so even if you start with keyword search to round up kind of a lot of results, once you find something that you're interested in, you might find yourself then um, using those more controlled subject headings to kind of drill down to a specific topic. And I think you'll find that um, that can be a really good uh, overall search strategy for a lot of situations. Now, I want to make one final point about keyword searches. Um, an additional virtue of keyword searches is that they can be used with wildcards. So wildcards are just basically special symbols that you can use to broaden your search and look for additional forms of a word or a name. Um, there are three main types of wildcards that you can use in the NEHGS catalog. Um, the first of these, just a single asterisk. This is used for truncation of one to five characters. So, for example, um, if you do a search for histor, H-I-S-T-O-R, uh, asterisk, then that will retrieve any word that starts with those letters and is followed by up to five additional characters. So your search results would include um, historic, but also historical and history. A double asterisk, our second, second wildcard type, is used for open-ended truncation. So mass, star, star, um, will give me any word that starts with those letters, no matter how many characters follow. So my search results would include both mass, the abbreviation, and also Massachusetts, the full name. And then finally, our last type, um, a question mark, can be used to replace any single character. So, for example, if I search for uh, women with a question mark between the M and the N, that'll retrieve both women, singular, and women, plural. So you can see how each of these wildcards can be um, kind of good tools for controlling for small variations in how a search term will appear in a record. Um, especially for variations like, say, plural versus singular and full versus abbreviated forms of words. Here you can see um, two of our wildcard searches entered in the keyword search box up here. Um, I won't so show you the full result list for this search, but um, do just keep in mind that if you want to use any of the wildcards that we just discussed, you would generally use them with a keyword search. Okay, so we're going to look at um, one more search type, and that's the advanced search. An advanced search can be useful for combining several different types of criteria and even combining different um, search types. To do an advanced search, um, we'll first click on the advanced tab, and then once you've got the advanced tab selected, then you can enter multiple search criteria using these drop downs on the left here. And you can use those to select um, specific search types. So here, we're combining a keyword search with an author search. So we're looking for resources that contain um, New York somewhere in the record, and were written by an author with the name Remington. And here um, are the results of that advanced search. So these results all have New York somewhere in the record. Um, these four that you can um, see on the screen at the moment happen to have it in their title, though, of course, it could appear anywhere else in the record since it is a keyword search. And then um, they also all have Remington as an author or an editor. Another way that you can use advanced searching is to limit um, a search to a particular location. And um, in particular, you might sometimes say, want to limit your search only to online resources. Um, and the advanced search is one way of doing that. So you might want to especially do this if, say, you're looking for resources that you want to use from home. So to limit for online resources, again, we'll start by selecting our search type. So going to the advanced tab, and then um, you can enter your search criteria. In this case, we'll keep it simple. We'll just stick with a keyword search for New York. Although, of course, you could add um, uh, several additional criteria if you wanted to. And then um, to limit for online resources, um, we will click down here at the location drop down in the lower half of the screen and select online. And here are the search results for that search. 
So as you can see, all of our search results are available online. In this brief record display, um, you can see some of the links to websites and to digital images and so on. Now we'll talk um, about different types of digital content that are available through the catalog in a, a lot more detail a little bit later in this presentation. Um, but for now, just keep in mind that an advanced search can be used to restrict your search to those resources that you're able to use from home. So we've just discussed several different ways of searching the catalog. Now, if you're going to be a regular user of our library and say there's an author or a subject um, that you often search for when using our catalog, then you might also be interested in using a related feature called preferred searches, which allows you to save any catalog search for later reuse. What this does is it allows you to avoid having to key in the search each time you use the catalog. Um, but be aware that this is a feature that's available only for any, any HGS members, so you want to make sure that you're logged into the catalog before you try to save a search. Um, one other thing that is nice about preferred searching, um, preferred searches also act as a way that you can kind of keep up to date um, on additions to our collection in a given subject area without necessarily having to redo the search yourself. So if you have um, a particular search saved as preferred, um, then you'll be notified um, by email, if you have it set up that way, um, to notify you when there are new items added to the collection that fulfill your search criteria. So let's walk through um, how you would go about saving a preferred search. Um, and going back to our subject search for the AFI family that we did before, if I want to save this as a preferred search, and then I'll click on the Save as Preferred Search um, button, which is at the top right here, um, just to the right of the search box. And as soon as I click on that, if I'm logged in, then that search is now saved in my account. Now, once you've saved one or more preferred searches, you can uh, view and manage your preferred searches at any time by clicking on the My Account button, which is at the top right corner of the screen. So now that you're in, the, um, you're in the My Library Account area, then you would click on Preferred Searches. So you'll now see a list of your preferred searches. Now at this point, um, you can click um, on the search link, uh, which is to the right-hand side of the screen here. Um, you can click on the search link that's associated with any of those preferred searches in the list in order to execute that search quickly and to see its results again, which, by the way, might be particularly handy if you've, say, put together a complex search with several search terms and limiters and so on. You can also set the searches um, so that you'll receive email alerts of new materials that are added to the library collection that match your searches. Um, to do that, you'll just check the Mark for Email box to the left of the search. And here are we would select maybe, say, the one for the Athy family that I just created. Um, and then once you've checked that, then you would click on Update List, just above there. Um, and as a side note, of course, you'll want to make sure that um, the NEHGS Member Services Department uh, does have your current email address on file so that you can be sure to actually receive those notifications. So once I've done this, um, I should receive a notification by email anytime the library acquires something new about the Athy family. Okay, so up to this point, um, we've been focusing on how to find resources by performing various types of searches in the catalog. I'm now going to turn things um, back over to Anne, who's going to talk about some additional services and features that are offered through the catalog. Thanks, Emily. We're next going to look at how you can use the catalog to access digital content and collections. There's three different types of digital collections that you can access through the catalog. First, there's the NEHGS Digital Library and Archive, which gives you access to ebooks and manuscripts that have digita been digitized by NEHGS based on the materials in our collection. We store electronic copies of these resources and provide access to them through our server. In general, you'll need to be an NEHGS member and logged into the catalog in order to access these resources. Second, we also provide links to public domain ebooks, which are made freely available on the web by sites like Hadi Trust, Google Books, and Internet Archive. These are available for both members and non-members, and you don't need to be logged in to access them. 
Finally, we provide links to ebooks that you can borrow through Open Library. These are generally books that are still in copyright, so you can only so they can only be checked out by one user at a time. You don't need to be an NEHGS member to access these books, but you will need to create an Open Library account in order to borrow, and we'll go over this in a minute. First, let's talk about the collections contained in the NEHGS Digital Library and Archive. Again, this is material from our library and manuscript collections that we've digitized. You do need to be a member to access this content, and you want to be logged into the catalog. There are over 1,100 items in this collection, and we continue to add to it. There are a few different ways to get to the NEHGS Digital Library and Archive. First, you can do a search of one of the types that Emily has gone over, and any digital items will meet, that meet your search criteria will be retrieved. They'll just be mixed in with all the print resources that match your search as well. On the main search page, there's also a digital library search box. This will perform a keyword search that is restricted to items in the digital library. From the main from the same main search page, there's also an option at the bottom of the page to browse the digital library. If I click on this, I'll be taken to a list of digital library and archive collections, which I can use to borrow to browse through to see digital content. As you can see, there are several collections of ebooks organized by the type of resource. We have one collection for family histories and genealogies, another for local history resources and vital records, and another for city directories. There are also a series of collections for online manuscripts, organized by the type of resource as well as the time period. We're looking at an example of a manuscript item in the digital library. Here we're viewing the full record display in addition to all the information that you would see in a catalog record, there's also a thumbnail of the manuscript, which you can click on in order to view the file online. This is what the document looks like when you click on the link. It will open up in a new window of the browser that you are using. Our online manuscripts are generally stored as image files. You can pick a page to view by either using the page arrows on the left, the page images on the left, or by using the arrows on the top left. You can also use the buttons at the top of the page to reduce, enlarge, print, or save the image. Now, one thing to be aware of is that some of our online manuscripts require Java to display properly. Java is freely available, and it's very likely that you already have Java installed on your computer in some form. However, Java installations do vary from computer to computer, so when you first click on the link to view a manuscript image in the digital library, your browser might give you a warning message. If you just follow your browser's prompts, you should be able to update or download Java relatively easily and you'll be able to access the files. We looked at an example of a manuscript in the digital in the NEHGS digital library. Now let's look at an example of an ebook. In this case, a genealogy, the Alexanders of Maine. In general, NEHGS ebooks are stored as PDF files. So when you click on the online version link in the center of the page, the ebook will open in a new window. Again, ebooks are, e are PDF files, so you'll be able to view them with Adobe Reader, which is freely available and easy to download, or any other PDF viewer that you have installed on your computer. The second type of digital collection available through our catalog is public domain ebooks from Hottie Trust, Internet Archive, and Google Books. These are generally books that are out of copyright, and the digital versions are preserved and made freely available by one of these sites. We provide links to digital versions of books that we also have in print at the library. You don't need to be an NEHGS member to access these books. You can just follow the links. Here's an example of a link to one of these public domain ebooks, in this case from Honey Trust Library. 
It looks pretty similar to the example that we looked at from the NEHGS digital collection, but you can see that there's a note that refers to the Hathi Trust version and a link in the middle of the page. When you click on the link, you'll be taken to the record for the book in the Hathi Trust digital library. Note that we're leaving the NEHGS catalog now and going to another website. You can click on one of the full version links to read the book. And here we are viewing the ebook itself. You have buttons along the top and the sides of the frame for changing the view and turning the pages. On the left, you can see that for this particular ebook, you also have the option of downloading PDF files of individual pages or downloading the whole book. One, the final type of digital collection that we'll discuss is links to open library books, which allow you to borrow digital copies of more recently published books in our library collection. We have over a thousand titles available in this form now, and we'll ultimately have thousands more. As with the other types of digital content we've been looking at, links to these ebooks are provided through the library catalog. Let's look at an example. This is one of the titles that is available to borrow as an ebook. Whenever you see this link that says, borrow digital version of this book from Open Library, that means there is a borrowable ebook version of this book available online, and you can click that link to access it. There's also a link provided to information on how the process of borrowing books works. With these Open Library books, one user at a time can borrow each book, and there is a two-week loan period before it has to be returned. The reason why these books can only be borrowed by one user at a time is that for many books published since 1923, there are copyright restrictions that require this. When I click on the link to borrow the digital version, I'm taken to this page on the Open Library website, again, leaving the NEHGS catalog. In the lower right under Borrow, there is an ebook link that I can select. When I do that, I'll be taken to the Open Library login screen. While you don't need to be an NEHGS member to access Open Library books, you do need to create an account with Open Library in order to do so. It's a free account and relatively simple to create. Just be aware that this screen is not asking for your NEHGS login. It's asking for a username and password specifically for Open Library. So at this point, I would either click on the link to open a new account, or if I already have an open library account, I can enter the information below in the fields. Once I've logged into open library, I see a few different options for how I might read the Mansfield genealogy. I'll select read in browser. You can also download a PDF or EPUB version if you have installed Adobe Digital Editions on your computer, which is also a free um, program. Once you've selected an option, you're informed that you have successfully checked out the book and you can go ahead and read it. At the bottom, you're told how many books are checked out to you and you can look at all your loans. Let's go ahead and read the genealogy we just checked out. This is how the book appears when I read it in my browser. You can click on the page to flip it. You can jump through the book by using the scroll bar at the bottom. You can zoom in and out to make reading easier. And you can search within the text in this search box. When you're ready to return the book, you can click this button at the top left and can also return it on the previous web page we looked at. So after you've spent all that time searching in the catalog, you've probably seen a lot of things that looked interesting and that you'll want to follow up on. 
I'll now show you a couple of other features in our catalog that will help you to organize and save these results and to use them in your search. You'll look, at, you'll look at and use many resources in your genealogical research, and it's important to keep the essential information about the sources, such as title, author, publication information, such as that which you'll find in the catalog records. Some of you might have experienced instances of seeing something in the library or coming across something in the catalog, which later you wish you had written down. These tools will help you with that task so you can find and remember what you looked at and include these items in your research log, citations, or bibliography. First, we'll look at saving results. Earlier in the talk, Emily pointed out the Save Record button. As you conduct your searches, when you see something that interests you, save it by clicking on the Save Record button on the right side of the screen. You can do this for as many items as you like. After you click on Saved Record, you'll see that the Saved Record icon has changed to Remove from Book Cart. These records will be added to your cart. You now have that record saved for later use. You can save records from this list display or when within an individual record. This saved information will remain throughout your session, so if you do another search, the items will continue to be added. When you're finished saving items, you can view what you've saved or what is in your book cart by clicking on the View Saved icon at the top of the page. Okay, here's my small list of three saved records. First, you can review the list and make any changes by selecting items from the boxes on the left, and then you can delete the selections if you like. Next, you want to select the format of the list. We recommend choosing the default format of full display instead of brief display so you don't miss any useful information from the catalog records. Um, EndNote and RefWorks are the names of two commercial reference management programs. If you happen to use those programs, you can use that option. After selecting the format, you want to send, send the list. Let's zoom in on the Send to List option to se section and review the options. We can email, send to screen, or save to local disk. First, emailing a list. You can send it to yourself or maybe to a friend or family member who is working with you and might be interested in something you found. Just put your email address in the mail to box and click submit. Here's the email that I received with the full display. You can see it gives you the title, author, and descriptive information, the subjects, and the location with the, within the library where this book would be. If you choose to send the list to the screen, it will look like this, and then you can use your browser's print option to print the results. When you send the file to a local disk, you'll get an exported text file to save on your computer. This screen is from the Firefox browser, so it might look different depending on what browser you use. Now that you have your list of sources, how can it help you? Are you planning a visit to the library? If so, you have valuable information to make your time more effective. You'll know the call numbers of the books you want to get and the floor they're located on within the library. You will also know what format the resource is in. So say you can look at all of your microfilm on the fourth floor at the same time. Also, if something is a manuscript, you can contact our special collections department to assure it will be available for you to use. If you can't make it to Boston, there are other ways to use the list of sources to help you locate copies of items. The information on the list will allow you to find book to perhaps purchase or to look for in a local library using a source such as WorldCat.org. WorldCat is a free online database 
that lets you search the collections of libraries in your community and thousands more around the world and will help you find the copy near you. In this example, I searched for and found the book Captain George Athey of Galway and Maryland that Emily showed earlier in her catalog search. In order to find the book near you, you can enter your location. Here I entered the zip code for NEHGS. Scrolling down, you can see that we own a copy of this book as do 23 other libraries, including ones in New York, Maryland, and Virginia. You may be able to visit one of these places, or your local library may be able to borrow this book from one of the other libraries listed. One final important note about saving records. When you leave your session with the NEHGS catalog, your saved records will disappear. So remember to save and send them before signing off. The final feature we're going to talk about is ratings. If you're looking for an easy way to remind yourself of what you looked at and what you thought of it, or if you want others to see what you thought, some, if something, you might want to use the My Ratings feature of the NEHGS Library Catalog. My Ratings allows members to rate books and other materials in the catalog, and also to view, change, and delete your ratings in the My Library account. When you're logged into the catalog, you can rate the material by clicking on one of the five stars nearer to the title to rate it, with one being the lowest and five being the highest. In this example, I've given the book Manuscripts at the New England Historic Genealogical Society five stars. You can view a list of the, all the materials you have rated by going to your account, click on the My Account button. Once you are at the My Library Account page, click on the My Ratings button. Anytime you log into your library account, you can view your rated items to remind yourself of what you looked at and how useful it was. A great way to keep track while using the books at the library and for return visits. Another good thing about using the ratings is that while your saved records disappear after each session, your list of rated items will remain each time you log into your account, and you can continue to add to this list. I think that you'll find saving and rating records to be great tools when using our online catalog. So this brings us to the end of our presentation. To review what we looked at today, Emily showed a variety of methods for searching. I showed links to both freely available ebooks and digital items in the collection for member use. We also looked at some features of the catalog to save and share records, create preferred searches, and rate records. If you'd like to find further information about the NEHGS Library and its offerings, you can go to the Using the NEHGS Library page on AmericanAncestors.org, and that URL is shown on the slide. And you can always email us at library at nehgs.org. Okay, thanks for listening. And now we're going to go back to Ginevra and answer uh, questions that we have time for. Thanks, Anne and Emily, for your great presentation. Um, now let's answer your questions. If you have a question about any of the catalog features demonstrated today, please type it in the question field on the right of your screen. Um, and a lot have been coming in, so we're going to try and, and answer as many as we can. Um, so here's a question for Emily. Um, Dwayne asks, um, I noticed that the search examples are spelled out in full. Is searching U.S., say, U.S. Civil War or NARA or any other kind of abbrevi common abbreviations, would that uh, still give you results? Uh, that's a very good question. So it, it sort of, <laughs> my wishy-washy answer is it sort of depends. <laughs> it depends on, um, for one thing, what type of search you're doing. So if you were doing a keyword search, then, you know, whether or not um, an abbreviated versus full form of a name retrieves something is really pretty dependent on how, um, how that name or word appears on the item itself, right? So if it appears as NARA in the title, then you'll get a, you'll get a hit. But if it's fully spell, spelled out in the title, or in the table of contents and so on, then you won't necessarily. So, especially with keyword searches, it often pays to try a different, a few different forms. Um, in the case of um, subject searches, um, 
this is one of the one of the slightly tricky things about subject searches is that you know they're a really great tool once you you know what um, kind of the authorized heading is that like the form in which the subject heading is entered but it, it's not always perfectly easy to guess <laughs> what that will be ahead of time for um, especially for a lot of you know organizations with longer names or you know things like that um, so in some cases depending on depending on what it is um, you might get um, a note um, similar to what we got when we first searched for Athy family without an E, um, say um, directing you from the abbreviated form of the name to maybe a fuller form of the name if that's how the heading is entered. But um, again, sort of depending on whether that is one of the references for that heading or not, um, you may or may not get that sort of thing. So. I mean, if you find, if you have a situation where you're, say you're entering, entering an abbreviated form and you're not really getting stuff in a subject search, I would recommend in that case um, maybe taking a step back and using a keyword search first. And once you start getting kind of relevant stuff, using those linked subject headings, which will tell you whatever the authorized form is, um, to navigate a little bit more precisely once you've found that. Great, thank you Duane for your question and Emily for your answer. Um, here's a question for Anne. Uh, Janet asks, if you want to request a microfilm from the Family History Library for use at NEHGS, um, can you find and request those, uh, those items through the NEHGS catalog? Hi, um, thanks for the question. No, uh, the LDS microfilm is not listed in the library catalog. What you would do is go directly to Family History Library and request uh, the microfilm that you're interested in, and then they will notify you when it is at the library, and you can uh, come here and use it. We hold them here for you to use, uh, but the ordering um, of them is something you do directly with the Family History Library. Thank you. And um, here's a, another question for, uh, for Emily. Um, Richard asks, uh, how do you do a binary search? For example, if you wanted to search for Athy but not John or Mark, um, can you do that within the search box or might you have to use the advanced uh, search tab to accomplish that? Yeah, in general, you're going to probably get the, the best results if you do that, I think, using the advanced search tab. And you will, we didn't really look in a whole lot of detail about um, some of the different options. There are a lot of different options on the advanced search. But um, for the most part, I think that um, for using those binary or Boolean operators, that and or not, and so on, um, it's probably the easiest to do that using um, the advanced search tab because you do have drop down specifically to say I want and or or not and so on. Wrong mic there. Um, a question for Anne. Is it possible to request photocopies of items um, in our library catalog that are not available digitally? Uh, yes, um, NEHGS does have a service where uh, they will photocopy an article or pages from a book for you, uh, and that service can be requested through NEHGS Research Services, uh, and you can find out more about the research services and the costs um, through AmericanAncestors.org or by contacting research services directly at research at NEHGS.org. Great, and another question for Emily. Um, Duane also asks, is that distinction between uh, subject and keyword searches, is that more or less universal and what you might find at other, through other repository catalogs? Uh, yeah, I mean in most, um, I think most library catalogs that I've seen these days will tend to have, um, they'll have a option for searching by keyword and they'll also then have another option um, for searching by um, subject and that more or less the way that that work will be relatively similar across probably most library catalogs that you um, that you encounter um, how your results are displayed um, after you do that search 
uh, might be a little bit different. Um, one thing that I didn't really um, say explicitly, but for example, um, a lot of the non-keyword searches in our catalog, say if you're searching the title index or the author index, those are, um, not to get too uh, jargony, but those are what's called a left-anchored search, where it's basically searching for the beginning of the title or the beginning of the name, that sort of thing. Um, so that's going to affect um, how you know what kind of search results you get depending on what how you put in your search criteria also for the um, subject searches at other libraries um you know it's always it can be a little bit different though they um, usually will be similar in having those different indexes that you can search at some libraries say um, it might not be left anchored in that way it might just be looking for sort of any um, hit within the field so um, overall the same but there there are you know, differences from institution to institution. Great, and uh, perhaps one last question since we are kind of running over uh, the time limit. Um, this is a question for Anne from Marie. Marie asks, uh, is the saved list of information that you can email yourself, um, would that provide adequate information uh, if you want to do a full source citation? Well, the full, yeah, the full, um, the full record that gets uh, mailed to you when you um, send the list is all of the information that's in the catalog record. Um, so I think it, that it should be sufficient for, um, for citing the resource. Okay, great. So um, I know that there were a few questions that we didn't get to. Um, if you have a question either that we didn't get to or if you think of something later, please contact us at library at nehgs.org. If you have more detailed questions about the specifics of your research, uh, consider scheduling a consultation or hiring our research services team. Um, and as Anne mentioned, if you have a photocopy request, you can uh, contact our research services team at research at nehgs.org. Um, and I will provide both of, the, both of these email addresses in the, um, in the follow-up email that you'll receive tomorrow. And again, thank you for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to develop, to develop and improve our webinars and other online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful. So I do thank you in advance. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash learning hyphen center. I hope you'll join us for future online programs, and goodbye for now.